Ladies and gentlemen, this is Eurobuzz. Please welcome your hosts, Jeff Carroll and Ed Wilde. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking with us through a uh, long and exciting day of science. Uh, you guys are a bit of a part of an experiment here. What we're hoping to do is to bring some of the excitement of the meeting here that we all feel uh, to our audience of uh, HD families uh, and caregivers uh, worldwide. We're recording and we'll be sharing this with families via our website, HD Buzz, uh, which for those of you who don't know, is an information portal online for HD families uh, to get information about both clinical and research news. So we all got a lot of excitement from scientists today, and we're hoping uh, via this short session tonight, which we promise will end on time, uh, to bring this home to families. So thanks for being here. So uh, what you're saying, Jeff, is that we're going to be offering a combination of science and entertainment, or scientainment. <laughs> Only Ed Wilde would say scientainment, so I would not, no, say that. Fine. Uh, we'll s but what... Uh, what we uh, will be doing, whether we refer to it as scientainment or not, is uh, shortly we'll be interviewing some of the uh, top scientists who've been presenting today or are presenting later on in the meeting um, so that they can talk directly to the global HD community about their research and share one or two facts about themselves in the process. Uh, and uh, later on we'll be uh, giving you an exciting sneak preview of some uh, changes that are coming up to HD Buzz in the very near future. But first, because it's been a long day and we've all been concentrating very hard, um, we want to wake everybody up with an exciting science quiz. So, everybody please stand up. This is not optional. This is the only exercise part of the whole thing, actually. <laughs> and uh, in case you're fe still feeling lethargic and unmotivated, the winner of our science quiz will be awarded Alfred, the, the HD Buzz fluffy neuron. <laughs> complete with dendritic spines. So, um, what more motivation could you possibly need? So, question one, Jeff. Okay, here we go. Uh, in honor of our host city, we're going to have a Nobel question. So, yesterday we visited the Nobel Museum, where they have a really great exhibit, you should catch if you can, in which laureates are asked to describe their prize-winning work in one picture. It's great. So, in honor of that, uh, let's think about HD. Gene silencing is a therapy we all talk about. Don't say it out loud. Uh, think in your head and keep silent if you know the name of this person who pioneered gene silencing and won the Nobel Prize in 2006. Okay, so everyone should have an answer. Don't say it out loud. And this quiz is based on an honor system. So you can stay standing if you got it wrong, but you're only cheating yourselves. Okay. <laughs> so the correct answer is, of course, Craig Mello, who won the prize in 2006 for his work on RNA, RNA interference. If you got that right, stay standing. If you didn't get it right, then be honest, sit down. Wow, that's, uh, that's really sorted the geeks from the chaff. Okay, we may not need all our questions here, Jeff. This is good, we're I think we may need to uh, dumb it down a little. <laughs> this, is photo gonna be, of Michael Hayden. this is gonna be really challenging. Okay, so this morning, Michael Hayden from the University of British Columbia shared a really important talk suggesting that Huntington disease might be uh, much more uh, prevalent than we thought. This has really important implications, so we wanted to make sure you were paying attention. Uh, Michael, huddle your shirt closed. Uh, when Michael was speaking, was he wearing a shirt that was checked, striped, or plain? Oh, remember, answer in your head. Don't say anything to your neighbors. Everybody got it? Michael, face front. All right. <laughs> okay, and the correct answer is, once again, be honest with yourselves and each other. It was a delightful blue striped shirt. And here he is having... Uh, having some help to recover from his wardrobe malfunction <laughs> earlier on. So if you said strike, stay standing. If you said anything else, uh, we, sit we down and shame. This is good. Okay, we're going to get... This is, we have the right number of questions. Okay. okay, final question. Recently on HD Buzz, we covered a piece of research out of Sweden uh, from Professor Jan Sundqvist. Is he here, by the way? Uh, suggesting that uh, Huntington's patients uh, are about half as likely as non-Huntington's disease patients to get what? Remember, in your head. Everybody ready? So what condition might HD, the HD mutation, protect you against? The answer is cancer. 
large epidemiological study looking at a huge population in Sweden, Huntington's disease patients after correction for age seem to be about 50% less at risk of cancer for a given age. Hmm. So, if you got that wrong, please sit down. Are okay, we down we're clearly down to a pool of hardcore geeks. <laughs> I think it's time for the tiebreaker. Okay, tiebreaker. So this time, closest guest wins. Uh, what is the official number of attendees at this meeting? Get a, get a very solid number, very precise in your head. Everybody ready? Yeah. Okay, everybody's ready. Ed, do you want to... Okay, we'll go from, oh, wait. From, our, from our left to right. Michael? Oh, no, Bernhard knows. Yeah. <laughs> Someone standing there. Neil. 200? You don't even want the neuron. <laughs> 640? 670? 701? This is going to be close. This is close. I can't do math. The correct answer is... 694! So Who's by closest? margin of one, I think Dr. Hayden gets it. Oh, he doesn't. He said 690. Yeah, okay. So he wins the neuron. Pay very close attention. You may need to uh, know about this in your <laughs> many future careers. And uh, what are you going to sing for us tonight? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> well done, Michael. Move to the... Okay, so let's move to phase two of our plan. It's time for our interviews. Uh, we're going to be interviewing three scientists, so we will move gently back into the couch area. And uh, Jeff will uh, introduce our first guest. All right, so we asked everybody for something fun. We want our uh, viewers at home to know the scientists are not uh, just machines, but people. So we asked for some fun facts about our people. So first up, we're going to talk uh, with Dr. Ray Truant at McMaster University in Canada. Uh, if you ask around, you'll find that Ray is very widely respected uh, in the scientific community. Things at home? I don't know. Ray's son, young Max Truant, recently graduated from uh, pre-kindergarten and uh, was asked what he wanted to be when he grew up, and he said a scientist. Very inspiring. The teacher went on to say, well, what is it that scientists do all day? To which young Max answered, eat cookies and watch YouTube. <laughs> Ray, so you want to come up and make some more YouTube? Come on. So, Ray, um, everybody here heard your scientific talk today, uh, but recalling that we're trying to make this uh, accessible for everybody, um, you study the Huntington protein, the protein that's mutated in everybody who has Huntington's disease. What does the Huntington protein normally do? Why do we have a Huntington protein? Uh, it's a big question. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a question that we've all been stuck on. It's an unusually large protein. It is about seven times larger than the average protein that we see in every single cell in our bodies. It has many functions, and we think one of the most critical functions is the fact that Huntington is, is involved in response to stress. And when I, when I say stress, I don't mean emotional stress of talking on a microphone in front of a large group of people, 694. Four. Uh, I mean uh, metabolic stresses. So these, these are actually chemicals that are, are frequently being washed into the neurons in the brain on a, on a boring daily basis, minute by minute. And when you say um, metabolism, you mean eating meta up sugar I mean, I mean energy. yeah, the, the you know, burning of, 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 uh, of sugar and, and producing of energy within the brain. And these stresses get different and they increase in the aging brain. And that is really what we're focusing on. And that the, the thought is that in a younger brain, Huntington has a, has a role, but it's a rather minor role. And as the, as the brain ages it has to take on more and more of an important role. And of course, with those with HD, it can't do that. And that's the reason why we're, we, we think we're seeing the loss of, of brain that's cells. That's why you think disease. Huntington's disease happens later in life because yeah. there's this aging brain problem. One reason, yeah. Okay. So you presented a ton of data, and one of the things that's striking about the work that you presented is you have all these beautiful technologies and techniques, and they let you basically follow the Huntington protein around as it goes about its business in the cell. And so as you've watched those movies that your students are producing, I mean, Maybe you're producing them. I'm not sure. No, He's eating cookies. <laughs> yeah, I'm, eating, I'm eating that. cookies in my office. I, What's the most surprising thing to you? What, what did you see that you didn't expect to see in those kind of movies? 
what we well what surprised us was that if we treated our cells very nicely and gave them lots of nutrients and the proper temperature and the proper life situation which is completely artificial nothing happened what was interesting is when we started perturbing the systems and making life difficult for those cells either not giving them enough nutrients or shifting the temperature on them all of a sudden we saw Huntington move from one location of the cell to a completely different location in the cell. And you think these, these environmental changes might be something like what happens in, for example, the aging brain? Right. That's exactly what we think is going on. And we think it's the movement of Huntington from one place to another and shifting in its function from doing something in one place to another that is defective in the disease. Okay. And so do you think that this kind of work that you're doing on the fundamental, how does Huntington work, is uh, useful for the development of therapies for Huntington? Right. So, I mean, in the, if we know the functions of the protein, we can understand which of those functions are being uh, changed in the disease. And if we know the exact molecular pathways of those functions, then we can identify what pharmaceutical industry likes to call targets. And we, for example, an, an optimum target is an enzyme that somehow changes Huntington. And Pharmaceutical industry is extremely good at inhibiting enzymes or promoting enzymatic activity. So, you know, in, in our outline of the scaffolding of, of what's going on in terms of pathways, we can hopefully uh, pull out these targets that then we can send the experts at pharma towards with, with small molecules. And just to chip in, an, an enzyme is, is a protein that makes a chemical reaction go faster in a cell. Yes, as opposed to something that sort of is a, like a building block or a yeah. structural process. So, for example, Huntington is not an enzyme. Mm. So that's why one of the reasons why it's so difficult to fix Huntington directly, because it doesn't have this enzyme activity that's relatively easy to target with a drug. Right. So, in, in, you know, in a lot of disease therapies, we've had our best successes from targeting enzymes. Excellent. Thank you, Ray. Okay, well, let's bring on our next guest, which is Dr. Mike Orth from the University of Ulm in Germany. Mike is a neurologist um, who studies real live human patients um, to find out more about Huntington's disease. Mike's wife uh, is from Catalonia. So there are sort of some gently simmering ethnic tensions in the Orth household, it seems. Um, so Mike was particularly pleased when he uh, figured out that his young uh, nephew had come up with an affectionate new nickname uh, for him. He calls him Tio Patata. Um, he was disappointed to find out, however, that this means that his nickname is Uncle Potato. So please welcome Uncle Potato. Yes, that's what you have to live with if you are a German marrying into a Spanish family. <laughs> uh, and not even Spanish as a Catalan family, so, but I don't want to go into oh, Catalan yeah. Spanish. Yeah, yeah, we won't go there. We won't go there. Difficult, we'll, difficult. We'll, we'll stop with the simmering ethnic tension. <laughs> We're happy with that. Okay, so Mike, you gave a, a really interesting talk earlier on about something called the default mode network. So, what on earth is a default mode network? It's a mouthful, for starters. I mean, you think about Bernhardt telling us about the boats. When, from the point in time when Bernard was telling us that we shouldn't miss those boats, I kept myself busy with how can I possibly avoid missing the boat? Because that's the last thing, last thing I want to do today, miss that boat or one of those three or four boats. So I wasn't doing very much. I couldn't really listen to many of these talks. I was there sitting, thinking, how can I possibly make that boat? <laughs> no. So the default there was some added is complications the part of the brain this. that deals with boats. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it deals with thinking what's expected of you in terms of behavior, what's going to happen next, and uh, how are you expected to perform. In this case, you know you have to make, make one of those boats, and you don't want to miss that boat. It's going to be, have to be avoid, avoided. Now, I've been thinking about potential obstacles. Obstacles could be me myself. Uh, thankfully, I haven't put on my high-heeled shoes today, so <laughs> I'd be perfectly mobile. That's uh, reassuring. But then I happen to have put my stuff into the office here, which is um, going to be locked at some stage. So I have been thinking, of how on earth am I going to get out the stuff I've got into that office, come back down and make one of those boats? And before that, I have to sit on one of these sofas here. Okay. So, so this is something that Question number two, what is the default <laughs> mode network? <laughs> <laughs> we get that you're worried about the boats. Yes, but you see, the, um, the part of the brain 
that I well I try to use them oh, okay. for that purpose how can I avoid the boat how can I make sure that I'm ready and I have actually got um, everything in place and I I know from past experience that it's a bad idea to miss these things okay so you play all this out in your brain so you listen into what your legs feel good so no no problem running if you have to mm -hmm. you have to think about where are the doors so you have to play up the scene okay we have yeah? okay <laughs> Work. This we mental imagery, this mental imagery yeah. is okay. something that the default mode network does. Now, the minute you step into action, mm -hmm. making the boat, ah, okay. all of this assessing of mental state, imagery should stop. Now, if I now start thinking, which I was tempted to do, about the boat thing, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to answer your questions. Okay. So it's very important to shift between states. Now, you have to make the best use of your default mode network in preparing something that you expect in the future, but you have to be able to focus your attention on your host in a given situation. From the boat. Yes. Okay. yes. So, in other words, the default network is the thing that helps you to plan the next thing, but then you switch it off when the next thing, when action is needed. Yes. And you studied it by sticking HD mutation carriers in, in an MRI scanner, functional MRI scanner which yes. looks at brain activity in different bits of the brain. It does. So what you do is you contrast two situations, one in which people have to actually do a task, so they have to be active with something specific, in mm. this case just pressing a button. Okay. And, well, uh, without, without going into too much detail, because we button. don't want to miss the boat. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what, did, what functional changes did you find in the brains of mutation carriers? Well, you find the same areas are active if the brain is idle or not doing anything or thinking about boats or whatever they've been thinking about. Mm. Same areas, but uh, some of the different players in the network, it's a team that plays together. One of the team, some of the team players um, were less capable of switching off. Okay. So they were still going on about things. Right. I don't know what they were going, going on about. about boats, for instance. Maybe. <laughs> whatever the boat equivalent was in that okay. scanner. But they were keep still busy. Right. Um, which means there wasn't a complete switch off or a sort of complete switch off which you would have expected and which you had seen in the controls. So it sounds like they may be like trying too hard in patients with the gene, is that right? Well, I don't know really what it means, but it, the other interesting thing is that we did a simple uh, functional assessment and uh, the reaction time, which is the time it takes to press mm. that button, was shorter and in those who had uh, left more players on the pitch, if you wish. So the more active the default mode network, the better the performance on that task. Now that may mean that uh, it is something they need to optimize function. To make up for having the, the muta mutated gene? Uh, possibly. I don't know what it means because it's a cross-section of study sure. and it's something that we looked only once. Okay. We don't know how it evolves and we don't know whether this is good or bad. We don't know any of this, but it's an interesting thing that you can test in future studies to see how things develop. Thank you, Mark. Okay, let's bring on our final guest. So finally, we'll speak with uh, Ed's boss, Professor Sarah Tabrizi of University College London. So as many of you may know, Sarah is a woman who uh, get what she, gets what she wants often. Uh, but what she wants has changed over time. So we've, uh, we've been looking for a fun story about Sarah that you all may not know. And according to Sarah's mom, uh, <laughs> she once caught two-year-old Sarah parading around the house with a clothes peg or a clothes pin for my uh, American friends. Uh, strapped firmly to the front of her diaper. When uh, her mom asked Sarah what she was doing, young Sarah replied, I want to be a boy so I can have a peg like Kenneth next door. <laughs> Please welcome Kenneth's favorite neighbor, Sarah Tabrizi. <laughs> so, Professor Tabrizi, What's it like being the most beautiful and intelligent Huntington's disease researcher in the whole world? On the, uh, hang on. <laughs> on the off chance that Dr. Wilde has a slight conflict of interest. <laughs> the very suggestion. I might, I might take over at this point. <sighs> so Sarah, you're the global head of the Track HD study, uh, a three year long study of uh, exhaustive means of looking at people carrying the HD mutation looking for changes. So this is finished in the sense that people have been through the study. What do we know now that we didn't know when the study started? Well, the study um, has start, studied pre-manifest and early stage subjects. So 120 pre-manifest subjects divided into two groups. Those who were further from onset, their predicted onset, and those closer to predicted onset. And 120 early stage subjects and 120 controls. And we've really mapped in ultra-fine detail 
the natural history of change over three years in that group. So looking at really taking on microscopic pictures of the brain, looking at how the brain's changes, as Julie told you about, really dissecting out thinking changes, movement changes, mood changes. It's like putting a group of people under a very big microscope. Yeah. Um, and we understand much more about... And I think in HD we have the advantage of this, that we are able to identify people many years before symptom onset. And we're really now trying to produce a map of the changes that occur many years before symptom onset through to early stage disease over 36 months. And, and now we've got the 36 month data, we're able to do that. So one of the uh, pieces of data that you showed that was striking or that has been showed from track HD to today uh, is the, the shrinkage in very specific regions of the brain. Um, and it's, it's amazing technology, so it's a really powerful microscopic look at it, but it could be a little despairing for people carrying the mutation that, gosh, my brain is shrinking. Although as was pointed out today, everyone's brain is shrinking, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so, so what's your take-home message? What's your feeling about this data and how people might feel about it? So I think the point that everyone's brain is shrinking, even as we're sitting here um, uh, waiting for the boat, and, <laughs> <laughs> which I do, I'm very aware that we've got a few minutes. So um, uh, the, the, the brain imaging sh changes are very striking. We're working very hard to try and understand how the brain imaging changes, the gray and white matter, and the connections between different parts of the brain, what that means. And Julie did mention that, because she said, we really need to try and understand how those brain imaging changes translate or, or um, give us a picture of what's going on and relating it to humans, thinking changes and mood changes. And that's what we're trying to do. So the brain imaging changes, they're very clearly associated with aspects of progression. But what we found in Track HD, and this was, and this is a, 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 the studies run like a clinical trial. It's very clear checking of the data, um, a, a data monitoring, and there's an independent statistical team. We found over 24 months, and now over 36 months, in over 24 months, the pre-manifest HD cohort didn't change significantly from controls in thinking tests, mood tests, motor tests. So they're still performing as well. Exactly. And over 36 months, those subjects further from onset did not deteriorate relative to control. So despite those brain imaging changes, people's brains are functioning very well. And this relates to the data that Nelly mentioned and that Mike um, talked about, which I'm going to talk a bit more about on Sunday, is that I think there's more and more evidence for a compensatory network. And so people's brains are able to adapt and change and um, and they have what's called plasticity and change the structure and functions new, new structures and grow help. grow new neurons and dendrites wow. um, uh, uh, theoretically but th there is evidence for this and it's a kind of mo modulating of the brain and that we know people can do that and we think symptom onset might be decompensation of those networks so there's an enormous amount to rescue and that one day and this is our aim that we can intervene and maintain those neural networks. And, and I think that's what we're really understanding, that people are functioning yeah. at a good level despite the brain imaging changes, so it's not bad news. That's great, thanks very much. So please join us in uh, thanking our interviewees. Thanks very much. Thank you guys, well done. They were good sports. Uh, okay, so just before we close, I would like to spend just a couple of minutes giving you an exclusive world first preview of some of the changes that are coming in the next few months to HD Buzz. Um, HD Buzz, as Jeff has said, is our, our online news portal at hdbuzz.net um, where you can get plain language um, Huntington's disease research news updates. We're supported entirely by donations from patient uh, organizations throughout the world. And in addition, we were, uh, uh, recently given uh, a, a grant from the Griffin Foundation in the USA, which is an independent uh, educational uh, charitable foundation. And that's enabled us to embark on an, a pretty exciting program of redesigning HD Buzz and really um, making some exciting changes. So this is the sneak preview of the new HD Buzz site, not live yet, but coming soon. As you can see, it has a, a, a new look and feel. It's a lot more uh, sleek. Um, it's a lot more easy to navigate from one story to another and to skip between things that interest you. A couple of things that we're excited about that you can see here. 
The first is the coming soon box at the top of the page. So um, sometimes a story comes out and it takes us a while, uh, you know, a few days to be able to write a story about it. But we want to be able to let people know that something exciting is happening. And that's what that will do. And next to that, you can see the start here uh, section of the website. This is something that's been requested by a lot of our visitors who are, are excited that they can get hold of all this research news, but they don't quite know where to begin. And so the start here page uh, really takes you, if you're someone who's completely new to HD, it takes you right from the very basics to talking about how we do research and why we do it, and then gradually introduces you to some of the most exciting techniques that are being used so that you're a bit better equipped for browsing your way around the rest of the site. Um, we've completely overhauled the glossary, and this is the bit that explains any technical jargon that we have to use. Um, so that's much more easy to use. It's searchable, and it's a much quicker uh, glossary. So hopefully that will be really useful. And um, this is an advance that ha hopefully will take us beyond the internet. Um, we're aware that not everyone likes using websites or social media. So what, what we can do now is every story is going to be automatically available for download as a PDF. So you can basically print it as an information leaflet. So if you run an HD clinic um, or a support group, or if you have a relative who is interested but doesn't like using the internet, you can print these PDFs and then they can just browse them, write notes on them, line the cat litter tray with them, whatever they'd like to do. And once this is a relatively small development, but it's an important one. Um, on the site, you, we list all of our translators and our, our writers. Um, but you, you, you can't find out who's done what. So um, when HDBuzz 2.0 launches in a couple of months, you'll be able to see who's written what article and who's translated it. So if you like the way something was written or you're interested to find out more, that's one way of, of going about it. And we've chosen a son here because I hope she's in the audience. And she uh, is one of our most enthusiastic and prolific um, uh, translators into Spanish. We, the list of articles that she's translated couldn't even begin to fit on a single uh, page. These are the 12 languages that HDBuzz is now available in. We launched 18 months ago. We're now getting somewhere between 80 and 90,000 visits per month um, in all of these 12 languages. I can't even uh, begin to attempt to say thank you to our translators in each language, but uh, they're there up on the screen. Please, uh, um, can we have a round of applause for our volunteer translators? Thank you. It really... It, it really does make such a huge difference to, to know that, you know, we write in English, but then it rapidly becomes accessible to millions and millions more potential people. I'd just like to briefly thank the EHDN Young Adults Working Group, Jamie, Adrian, and many other people here and elsewhere who've made HD Buzz possible. And we're nearly done. Go on, we'll have a little ripple. Okay. I'm a big fan of applause for everyone. Uh, one final thing before we go to the boat, I suspect Michael's gone already <laughs> and is swimming across the channel to this city hall. Jeff. So uh, one bit of fun just to think about between now and tomorrow night when we're back. Uh, for a chance to win a very special prize, which we have yet to come up with or buy, uh, we are having the first inaugural Euro Buzz caption contest. So, Ed. Please send your uh, wittiest... <laughs> Uh, dirtiest, most interesting <laughs> caption for this photo uh, to editors at hdbuzz.net. And if you can explain to us what Bernard is whispering in Alexander Durr's ear, that would be great. Uh, only clean suggestions will be entered in the contest, but we'll keep the dirty ones. Thanks very much. Uh, so uh, whoever has the wittiest will win something wonderful tomorrow. Um, so thanks on behalf of Ed and myself. Um, see you tomorrow about the same time for one more round of this. And now Bernhard asked me to tell you to get your butts on the boats. Thank you. <laughs>